Good afternoon, colleagues. Welcome yet again to the weekly UCT Department of Medicine COVID webinar. We have an exciting lineup this afternoon with four, four colleagues from the United Kingdom who are going to share their experiences with us. Again, just for housekeeping, that everybody is unmuted as they, at least everyone is muted as they enter. Uh, we will be opening up the chat line in the latter half of the webinar this afternoon. Questions will come to us as hosts and Wendy will be handling those. And again, just to say that uh, we are grateful on behalf of Wendy Spearman and myself, Mark Sundrop, to the University of New Mexico for extending their Project ECHO license for us uh, at, at UCT to run these webinars. So uh, I'd like to hand you over to your chairperson for the afternoon again, Professor Graham Mankies. Graham? Thanks very much, Mark. Um, so we've got a different format for our webinar uh, this afternoon. We're joined by four colleagues from the UK uh, who will present uh, each of them a short presentation followed by a panel discussion uh, that we will take questions through the, the chat function to, to the presenters. So as you all know, um, the United Kingdom is one of the countries that has been most severely affected by COVID-19 globally. Uh, with, I just checked uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, 299,000 cases, making it the fifth highest uh, number of cases globally, and over 42,000 deaths in that country. And we've read uh, in media reports in South Africa uh, about the huge numbers of hospital admissions and deaths in hospital, as well as in care homes in the UK, uh, really devastating effects, particularly in the elderly population of that country. Um, and this crisis has posed uh, one of the greatest challenges um, in the 72 year history of the National Health Service. Uh, but we've also heard stories of the resilience of healthcare workers in that country. Um, and, you know, under severe strain, as well as innovations and adaptions of the clinical service uh, that have helped them to deal with uh, COVID-19. And I think there are important lessons that we can learn as, as we face the epidemic surge in South Africa. And, and just yesterday, we heard uh, the, the practice changing results of the recovery trial, really impactful findings uh, from a large multi-center trial of dexamethasone and other interventions in hospitalized patients in, uh, with COVID-19 conducted uh, across multiple hospitals uh, in the UK. And, and these findings uh, for the first time provide us uh, with an evidence-based pharmacological intervention uh, for treatment of patients with COVID-19, and we'll be looking to implement that uh, in our hospitals in South Africa. So, the, you know, I think there are important lessons that we as clinicians uh, in South Africa can learn from our colleagues in the UK who've dealt uh, with the surge of COVID in that country. So it's a great pleasure to have four colleagues join us uh, for the web webinar this afternoon uh, to share their experiences and insights on COVID-19 having worked in the front lines of the NHS over the past months. And I'd like to introduce the four panelists are uh, Dr. Erica Peters, Infectious Diseases and Internal Medicine uh, in Glasgow. Um, Dr. Alistair McConaughey, uh, Infectious Diseases and Internal Medicine also in Glasgow. Chris Carlin, Respiratory Medicine and Internal Medicine in Glasgow. And then finally from London, Dave Moore, uh, who's Infectious Diseases Specialist and Tropical Medicine Specialist based at University College Hospital in London. Um, so the format is we will have uh, each of the, the speakers uh, give a short talk, uh, eight minutes or so. Um, and then after each of them has given a talk, uh, we will then go on to, um, from, uh, from, from the, uh, we will have a panel discussion involving each of the Here's speakers. What I found. Sorry, let me just switch that off. Panel discussion from each of the, the, the speakers, uh, it, it, involving each of the speakers, as well as hearing from the chat room uh, questions that, that you posed to, to the, the speakers. So first up is Erica Peters. Erica is a consultant in infectious diseases and internal medicine in Glasgow with a special interest in infection and complex case care needs in vulnerable homeless people who inject drugs. Erica developed community triage procedures and systems aimed at reducing hospital admissions, working with Public Health Scotland and primary care. So over to you, Erica. We're very pleased to have you on and aware that you've taken time out from a busy clinic and might not be able to stay on for the whole webinar, but we look forward to your input. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. So as you've, as you've said, I'm not entirely sure why I got asked to try and support the community set up for this, but I do have background in trying to set up HIV clinics and that sort of thing in 
the more vulnerable populations that work quite a lot, a lot across hospital and community settings. So I'm going to skip through quite a lot, lot of this quickly, but and I am going to have to head off. So please, I've got my email address there. So if there's any particular details that you'd like from me after this and things I don't cover, uh, please, please email me. Uh, so very brief background uh, for those of you that are not aware. So you know, the UK is made up of four nations, Scotland being one of it. And we have to think about that in our public health approach. Uh, but the difference is uh, that we do have different um, health systems and uh, the Scottish NHS is, is devolved from uh, the UK and the English system. Uh, so we do have our, our ability to kind of um, diverge slightly in how we manage things. Uh, the health board, the, Scotland is, is split into health boards by area and we do have a large urban population. So I'm hoping you can see my mouse here, but um, essentially this is the urban population in the centre, in centre, but we do have remote and island communities. So we had to think about this as well in terms of our setup for coronavirus. Um, and as you said, you know, uh, the, the Scottish figures um, have also mirrored essentially the epidemic that we saw throughout the UK. And um, we have about 16,000 cases um, as part of the, the cumulative total. And that, as with the UK figures, that will be an underestimate of what we have. Uh, and we've had over 2,000 uh, deaths in Scotland. Um, so thinking about this and thinking about our approach, we have um, a, a national public health uh, set up here, public health. Uh, Scotland, uh, which was also in the middle of the pandemic, renamed and restructured, which was uh, added some of the complexity, I have to say, but um, I'll try and hopefully move forward to the next slide. So, yeah, the background population, of, uh, essentially a Caucasian population of about 5 million, um, are, you know, we have significant deprivation in Scotland, and we've seen with the COVID outbreak that we have got uh, differences in deprivation index as well. Um, but the average life expectancy is around about 80. Uh, we really don't have very much private medicine at all. It's a free healthcare for all. Um, and everybody here has a single primary care provider uh, with local, uh, with, a, with an, a unique identifier, which helps us to collect data. We're reasonably well set up for transfer, transfer of data between primary and secondary care. And we already had established, you know, 24 hour helplines that anyone could phone up, the public could phone up to get uh, clinical advice. And that was staffed by senior healthcare workers that already existed as part of our health service makeup. And also, I didn't mention that, but also with some IT support around that with websites and things that you could uh, go to to get self help. So, hopefully, we'll move to it. Yeah. So, um, when we were thinking about this, we were thinking about this in February this year. And I think it's probably important to think about this in the context we were thinking around and why we designed it this the way that we did. Um, and um, I haven't got any um, slides particularly in the epidemic, but hopefully you'll see my arrow in a second. Yeah, here we go. Uh, apologies, my arrow is not there. But if you can see the uh, slide um, with the epi curve, uh, at the very beginning of that, the first case we had in Scotland was the first week in March. And you know we were very concerned with the, the uh, reports coming through from Italy um, about the huge numbers of uh, patients requiring uh, secondary care and in particular ventilation support. Um, and at that time, we didn't have the modelling data uh, that came out subsequently, um, which obviously can change to the public health approach uh, significantly throughout the UK. So we were thinking about largely those aspects of it when we were trying to design the primary care side of things. Uh, we wanted to think about, um, you know, just like a flu pandemic plan, I suppose, how did we keep the COVID patients separate um, in the community and in, in community healthcare settings as well as in secondary care? And what would we have to do to restructure our primary care uh, to try and support managing patients in the community as much as possible? And obviously there's a very complex background behind it that we had to consider PPE, IT infrastructure, the training of a whole variety of staff, uh, testing, which I'm not going to touch on, but as you know, in the UK, we didn't do, uh, we didn't test all the way through. Um, and transport issues, how did we move patients around if we were going to have them seen face to face anywhere? And the, the absolutely uh, sort of biggest headache in a way, and the thing that was most important to do well was all the comms, all the communications around this, uh, which was, you know, a massive job. So this was, this was supported by the Scottish government. We'll move to the next slide. Um, so this is what we came up with. This is kind of on a, a back of an envelope. So we work between um, public health clinicians, between uh, hospital clinicians, uh, with the primary care representatives, with government primary care representatives, as well as um, representatives from all the local areas. And this is what we came up with, was this sort of triaging uh, pathway. 
Um, and there's a lot behind this, as you can imagine, uh, which I won't have time to go into today. But thinking about a patient uh, that had some sort of symptoms, phoning up the national helpline, and we had to make it national, um, and we couldn't launch it piecemeal um, because of the way things were set up. Um, we had set up algorithms that, you know, was not a unique thing because we have algorithms for a whole host of things, you know, chest pain, whatever it is. Um, so we set up algorithms for that to be managed. And we had to think about what was it that a patient could describe over the telephone that would mean that we'd need to think about them as requiring a face-to-face -face consultation or, you know, indeed needing to come um, in, as, an, as an urgent uh, patient to hospital. Um, and also thinking as well about patients that we could manage in the community or it was inappropriate to send them to hospital, for, you know, perhaps due to comorbidities that they would actually not benefit from hospital admission, elderly patients with frailty, etc. So essentially what happened was a patient would phone up, they would be triaged down to a local hub, which was also a telephone service. That local hub would have uh, much more information. They would be able to link to the case record in primary care. Um, and again, these were all managed by senior healthcare um, providers, either GPs or senior nurses. And then that, that local hub setting, they would decide whether the patient needed either an urgent ambulance to hospital or um, a clinical assessment. And we set up things that we, we ultimately called them CACs, clinical uh, COVID assessment centres, um, where patients could be seen by healthcare providers, uh, senior healthcare providers who could do a face-to-face -face assessment. So for example, get a good history, examine them, check their saturations, that sort of thing. And these were, we allowed there, there to be some freedom because of the diversity through our um, population in terms of rural, etc. We allowed there to be some freedom as to who manned these. So each board was responsible for setting that up. Um, but largely these were manned by GPs or, uh, or senior nurses. Um, and at that stage then there were there were three possible outcomes. One was they definitely needed to go to hospital um, and the, the other was that they could be managed at home. And the other thing that's not in this was that in some centres we were able to link in with uh, respiratory teams essentially based on the COPD type uh, nursing teams that we had in the community where we could uh, provide some patients, not all patients, but some patients with oxygen in a community setting if required go to the next slide. So apologies for these. These are two of the posters. They're, they're in portrait format, um, but unfortunately they've slipped a bit. So these, I've got the links for the, all this, this at the end of my talk, but essentially these were for primary care and they were set up to um, allow primary care providers who at the time would have absolutely no experience of managing COVID and there was a lot of anxiety about it, but allow them to manage patients through either the hub setting or um, by telephone or in some cases, but not all cases initially over a video consultation um, or face-to-face -face ultimately if they ended up at the COVID assessment centre. Um, I'll probably just draw your attention, and apologies my mouse isn't working, but to the very bottom of that section four, um, where we did look at uh, whether they were in a nursing home, uh, whether they had frailty or not, and whether they had um, an, an assessment in terms of treatment escalation or a DNA in, in place. And there, were, there was the opportunity to manage those patients um, as, as uh, decided by the um, senior decision maker at the, at the place they were seen, uh, whether they would be managed in hospital or not. Um, and the next slide is um, essentially the second part of that document, which is normally in portrait format, so it has slipped a little bit. Um, but these are the kind of parameters that, that uh, we were kind of reminding people to look at. And also the big concern, obviously, is that we were missing patients with treatable serious illness um, that, uh, um, just because of the concern about coronavirus and not having a full medical assessment because of the infection control issues. Um, um, at the bottom, we, we allowed, these were essentially in poster form, um, so each area could put their appropriate uh, local contacts on so it was easy and quick to manage all of that. So um, there's, there were a lot of outcome measures and I've only listed some of it, but just some of the things that we had to think about was, you know, divided, we divided this into four groups, thinking about pathways, adults, pregnant women, remote and island communities and children. Um, we, we did this on the background of having NHS Inform, which is the, the website, which a lot of information subsequently went on there to help patients with things like um, you know, uh, medical certificates for work and all that sort of thing. All these things were available and you can look at that if, you, if you're interested later uh, um, on the links. Um, and, you know, there was, there was a huge amount of work done in the community to try and support patients as far as possible not to come into hospital. 
Um, I think probably important to know, and this is in the context of where we were at in the UK uh, with the testing problems that we had at the time, or, or the, the decisions made not to, to test um, in March, uh, was that we did not have testing available in any of these uh, hubs at all, or in A&Es, uh, because uh, the concern was that uh, we weren't testing anyway, there was issues around capacity, and what we didn't want to do was overwhelm these places with people just wanting a test done as well. Um, now that, that has changed subsequently and we're now at the other side of the epidemic, but these were the considerations at the time that these were not testing centres, they were separate entities altogether. Um, what we were able to assess, and I've got some examples of these in the next slide, and there's a whole host of things you could look at to decide whether this was an effective measure or not, um, but we were able to look at this and, and one thing, you know, group that I haven't, I put this in really to remind myself, was the, the uh, effect of our ambulance service. We also have a national ambulance service that is free as well. Um, and they, they um, managed to support a huge number of patients in the community without having to bring them up to hospital as well. And we had protocols in place for the Scottish Ambulance Service to do that. Um, so again, I don't, this hasn't projected very well, unfortunately, I think. For some reason, it's missed, um, it's missed a slide. Apologies for that, but you can look these up. So we can look at, at whether this was effective in terms of, um, you know, different aims. Obviously, there's a clinical aim here, um, and there's there's aims in terms of uh, the hospital service, and obviously there's all the concerns about care homes. And care homes were not, I, I would say, um, largely thought about at the very beginning of this. It wasn't really an area that we considered. The care homes are, are a mixture of. Um, uh, public and private entities um, in Scotland um, and the, the thought really was a focus on how to manage patients outside of hospital as opposed to a focus on how to manage patients in care homes and that was something that was picked up later by a sort of a separate group. So I asked, so I'm not primary care but I'm my primary care of colleagues that were very much involved in this uh, you know I asked them this week saying I was doing this talk what were the what were the key things that were important and, and I agree with all of these. They said, you know, it's very important to engage with primary care earlier and I appreciate your primary care is set up differently. But I think for, for our setting, it was very important. And we considered um, other institutions such as prison sectors and things like that. And clearly we probably should have had a, more of a focus on our long-term care facilities, particularly with the very high risk group. Um, and at the time we were thinking much more of the broadly immunosuppressed patients as opposed to the elderly patients, I think, as being high risk. Um, communication, um, I think, you know, I'm sure is alluded to in every single talk you, there, you do, but between staff groups as well, the, the, the public was really vital. I, mean, I think our own First Minister has had a very honest and transparent approach largely with the public and healthcare workers, and I think that has been largely appreciated. Um, and I think I think transparency is, is has been vital. Um, Treatment escalations plans, I haven't mentioned this, but our primary care, although they weren't seeing patients face to face, did a huge bit of work um, phoning up patients that were potentially vulnerable, um, elderly patients, and discussing with the telephone with them thoughts about treatment escalation if that wasn't already in place, and that was documented. And I think um, there was a lot of comms uh, about that. So by and large, patients were and not surprised by getting these sorts of uh, telephone calls, although there was obviously some criticism about how they were handled. Um, but largely, I think that was a really helpful thing to have happened, and um, my patients largely appreciated it. Um, the infrastructure wasn't completely there at the beginning to enable virtual and telephone consultations. Uh, very few of the GPs had the ability to do video type con uh, consultations, although that has changed now. Um, there obviously were high profile people that uh, I think caused some issues with primary care uh, messages, including our own um, health. Uh, health um, chief medical officer who had to resign um, over not following the rules, if you like, and I think that has caused primary care quite a lot of difficulties as well as the higher profile ones more recently in the UK. Um, they continued their vaccination programmes, they cut back a lot of things, but they felt very strongly and continued all vaccination programmes and had the ability to do that. Um, and they also wanted to highlight how much palliative care, the, the primary care doctors do quite a lot of palliative care and they support the nursing homes in terms of medical support um, and so they had to, to enhance their palliative care and learn a lot about that very very quickly in terms of COVID palliative care. So I'm going to finish there, I've put some links at the end um, that have all these um, these uh, 
inf all the information from Scotland and more uh, things I've had to put um, done. We I was also involved in doing a lot of infographics locally for clinical management and I've got quite a lot of them which have gone down very well so I'd be happy to share them with somebody later and I'll finish there. Uh, Graham, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much Erica. So that was a great start to, to hear about from you know, from the community and, and the primary care perspective. Um, we're going to move on uh, to Alistair. So Alistair McGonaghy is uh, an infectious diseases physician working in Glasgow and clinical lead for the service um, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Special uh, interest in travel related infection, but he describes himself as a jobbing ID physician with a very clinical caseload. Uh, Alistair also works as an acute physician in the immediate uh, assessment unit at Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. Uh, and has been delivering uh, HDU care for COVID-19 patients over the last few months. And Alice is going to discuss his, his clinical experience as well as the hospital organisational response. So thanks very much, Alistair. Thanks very much, Graham, uh, and thank you for inviting me to talk. So I think what I'm going to present, I'll present some of the changes that we need um, but a lot of it is going to be my kind of personal reflections and observations on some of the aspects and, and challenges that, that we faced with really quite significant changes uh, to the way, that we, the way that we work. So I, I thought I'd start with a timeline because it probably puts in context a, a lot of the stuff that we did and, and really highlights the fact that we spent a lot of time developing uh, techniques for various processes. Um, really from back in January when we increasingly were getting calls about returning travel uh, with flu-like illness and concerns about COVID. And we were seeing a lot of these patients, they, they weren't, as Erica highlighted, being assessed fully in, in general practice and someone had to see and assess and, and test um, individuals and that largely fell to the infectious service based at the, at the Queen Elizabeth. And as the case definition widened to include other geographical areas, whole of China, then the, pretty much the whole of Southeast Asia, and then we started to have the outbreak in, in Europe centered around the north of Italy. These, these numbers increased. We then got to, through to the beginning of March when we started to get positive cases. Fair to say that we screened a lot of returning travelers before then who were negative and then had the, the kind of sudden influx of, of positive cases largely based on individuals returning from Italy, it has to be said. So it was European uh, returning travellers rather than those from, from Asia. Um, the Scottish government were in a, or had a, the UK government rather, had a kind of policy of containment. And there was a belief that we should admit all of these patients regardless of their clinical syndrome. The feeling being that if we could get them into hospital and we could keep them in hospital as until such time as their um, swabs were negative uh, before discharge, we could prevent uh, spread throughout the community. I have to say that given what we now know about the virus, I think this, with the benefit of hindsight, was, was undoubtedly a slightly naive um, approach and one that um, caused a lot of angst amongst ourselves and other clinicians as our beds filled up. And bizarrely, when we got to March and it was clear that we had widespread transmission in the UK with large numbers of patients being sent up for assessment, it became a little bit easier for us because it, it became everybody's problem. But what that initial kind of month and a half period did was it allowed us to refine a lot of the processes. We started off admitting people to negative pressure rooms, wearing full respirator PPE, and then suddenly it became clear that actually this is droplet spread, we can reduce the PPE, we can actually just use um, standard rooms. We developed routes into the hospital and it gave us a, a kind of experience which allowed us to develop a lot of the processes um, to CSS, treat, admit and discharge uh, possible COVID patients. And I think it's fair to say now, and I'm sure that others uh, who are on the call will, will agree that the the kind of era that we're in now is 
brings an equal amount of challenges where we have a, a kind of fear of COVID, given what everybody has been through. Everyone's exhausted. But the real challenge now is trying not to um, allow kind of fear of COVID to, to stop us from providing the important clinical care that we need to for the populations that we look after. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Um, generally, I'm going to say, what did we do? What do I think went, what are the things that I think went well? And what would I do differently um, given uh, everything that we know about the illness now? So this is the hospital. This is the, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Um, it's actually the Southern General, uh, as Graham decide, described at the start. But this is a large, modern, purpose-built hospital. So 1,677 acute, acute hospital. And it's important at the outset to say it's a hospital of single rooms, which clearly is a massive advantage when you are dealing with um, a pandemic of a respiratory illness, but there are also areas on site, most notably um, geriatric rehabilitation wards, which are not single rooms and are standard, standard six bedded areas. Um, so there is a significant amount of experience to come from that. It's busy. I think it's probably as busy a receiving unit as any. Through our GP assessment unit, we will routinely see between 60 and 80 GP referrals a day. Um, I tend to do Mondays, which is always a good day to do. And in the middle of winter, that will be over 100 uh, GP referrals um, per day. So it's busy. And our immediate assessment unit where we see the GP referrals is largely cubicle based. It looks like an, an emergency department. We also have a separate medical receiving area that patients admitted from the emergency department go to, um, which are largely split up into specialty receiving units around the lines of uh, medicine for the elderly, gastroenterology, and then a kind of a general medical catch-all staffed by rheumatologists, ID, um, diabetes and endocrine. So the full spectrum of, um, of medicine. So it's a very complicated slide and I'm not sure how well um, the, the kind of diagram, the flow diagram on the left uh, projects, but it's really just to, to highlight the changes that we had to make to the front door of a hospital. So essentially what I've described are two front doors, one that you can enter through the emergency department and the other that you can enter through um, a GP referral to the hospital. I'm mean, very conscious that at the front door, um, we had to try and keep COVID patients and non-COVID patients separate um, to really kind of facilitate assessment and review of COVID patients and to reduce the risk of, um, of nosocomial infection. And that's what this SATA box um, up, the, up in the, the kind of top right of the pink area um, is there to describe. And that was previously the surgical receiving area the surgeons had a lot, pretty much all of their activity uh, cancelled bar emergencies and we moved in and took over their receiving area, which gave us a separate front door to the hospital, which we staffed. And that ARU5 below SATA is their kind of surgical admissions ward, a 30 bedded ward, which we also took over as the place that we would admit uh, patients who uh, were query COVID patients who we felt required to be admitted to hospital. So this was all in an attempt to try and facilitate rapid review. It was heavily front loaded with consultant staff so that you have a very senior review early on to try and facilitate discharge. Um, we had very uh, rapid radiology, we could get chest x-rays reported within 30 minutes and we were admitting to defined clinical areas. The downstream wards, the people that then needed admitted beyond that, we tried to concentrate COVID patients into certain clinical areas where we felt we had the expertise to manage and importantly, the exper expertise to manage using PPE. And that was largely ourselves in infectious diseases. We took over extra wards and um, colleagues in respiratory medicine because um, clearly this is a very oxygen hungry and an oxygen complicated uh, disease. Um, and given that that was the only treatment that we had at the time, that was clearly very important. Our colleagues in medicine for the elderly also had to step up and see a lot of patients, um, given the, the 
likelihood of older people being infected. And the whole point was to try and maintain flow through the hospital so that you could manage your capacity. So reflecting upon that, we really made very rapid changes in process. We had very empowered clinicians. We were largely able to bypass a lot of the usual um, management bureaucracy that, that comes, I'm sure, with every healthcare system. Um, we canceled a lot of elective work. Teamwork and coordination is vital. You've all got to speak to each other. There is a massive amount of interdependency. At the front door of the hospital, I'm relying on five or six different specialties in order to allow me to uh, assess patients. Everybody needs to know what their place is in that system. I think we now appreciate that COVID is a very wide presentation and we did try to um, nominally identify COVID in non-COVID areas and clearly the natural progression of this is cohorting. It's challenging. It's hugely challenging given the wide presentation. Um, and I think we need to accept that with the best will in the world, you are going to put COVID patients into what you may regard as non-COVID areas. And therefore, infection control procedures need to be standard across all of these areas. And the concept of COVID in non-COVID areas needs to be tempered with the understanding that there will be COVID patients in there. And I think reflecting very much at the minute, this is exhausting and people who initially stepped up to the plate and worked very, very hard will rapidly become disillusioned and tired. Um, certainly as numbers start to wane and the adrenaline wears off. So staff, staff welfare is just so important for your staff, for patients, for all of these processes. I'm going to talk about PPE. I'm not going to talk about what to use, but um, really some observations on PPE because as already suggested, this is a huge issue in the media, certainly, and probably in reality in a lot of clinical settings throughout is the issue of personal protective equipment. This was what we were wearing as standard personal protective equipment, droplet um, protection, gloves, plastic apron, uh, fluid repellent, surgical mask with uh, uh, a visor, clearly that up to a respirator mask and full length gowns when we were doing aerosol generating procedures but this is largely what we used for managing patients. My personal belief is that this is absolutely adequate and probably a wee bit over the top in terms of PPE, but my reflection would be that you just cannot assume that everybody knows how to use PPE. And there's a huge amount of education which needs to go alongside handing PPE to people who are not familiar with using it. As an ID physician, I think I fail to appreciate the fear of contagion that can happen in other individuals um, and, and their nervousness about it, which translates into them wanting incrementally higher levels of PPE without appreciating the risks that come with that. I think all ID physicians will appreciate that when you're using PPE, the biggest risk is when you're removing that PPE. And I'm not sure that we actually got that message out there. And the other issue has been infection of staff and particularly staff infecting patients, uh, nosocomial spread. I think we have to appreciate that everybody can infect everybody else. And I think staff were very careful and very concerned about being infected from patients. I think in reflection, we were less um, aware of the likelihood of us actually being infected from colleagues. So I think it's important for us to reflect on the fact that staff are probably just as likely to catch COVID from their colleagues as they are from patients. So it's very important that people look at office space, avoid large gatherings, these large auditorium based meetings and things. Social distancing at the workplace from your colleagues is really important, but clearly comes with challenges. I think we now accept that there is a significant amount of asymptomatic carriage and asymptomatic transmission. And there's several very good studies now, which would show that people shed virus and are um, can transmit virus before they develop symptoms. So all of these things make it very difficult to identify um, people who may be spreading. And therefore universal um, infection control procedures are just vital um, in all settings, hand washing and alcohol gel. We had sessional use of face masks, so we kept face masks on for an entire ward round, for example, touch your face less uh, when you're removing and using gloves and aprons. The other thing that strikes me now looking at this 
is not disadvantaging those who don't have COVID. So yes, COVID in hospital mortality in the UK, 26%, that's based on the ISARIC data. It's an international database, but the UK data um, suggested that about a quarter of people being admitted uh, died. But the mortality may be higher in those who don't have COVID. And a lot of people on the, on the webinar will appreciate this, that whenever you have outbreaks, um, you have to be very careful against um, disadvantaging those who don't have the outbreak that you're managing. So thinking about maintaining outpatient services, how you model your inpatient services and how you continue to do community care, as Eric has already described, is very vitally important. And when you have patients in hospital, being aware of, of not being able to provide optimal management to them for their non-COVID illness because of concerns about COVID. So to conclude all that, we did a huge amount of change very quickly. Um, not all COVID needs admitted, and that's not necessarily a message uh, which comes out in our media anyway. Nosocomial spread is a very real thing, and we had issues with that in a hospital with single rooms, and we had significant issues in places like geriatric rehab facilities. Um, and we have to maintain our non-COVID work. Never underestimate the fear of contagion. It's huge. People have to understand what PP is protecting them about and feel in control. Um, and we need to look at all aspects of our work and think about risks. And yes, that's patient care. Yes, it's meetings. And as Graham alluded to in a chat earlier on, it's things as simple as travel to and from work. So I'm going to stop there. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alistair. That, that was great. And, and uh, you really uh, crystallized out some important messages and, and some important parallels to, to our experiences in South Africa. So we're going to move on and our next uh, speaker is Chris Carlin. Chris is a consultant in respiratory medicine in Glasgow, honor honorary clinical senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow with a special interest in non-invasive ventilation and remote monitoring of home therapy for patients with CRPD. Uh, Chris has developed SOPs for CPAP use in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 and he rapidly uh, led the expansion of capacity to deliver CPAP uh, by re repurposing available non-invasive -invent non ventilation kits in Glasgow. Uh, so so uh, Chris is really going to speak to us from a pulmonologist perspective about innovating uh, in the face of, of COVID-19 uh, in the UK. Thanks. Over to you, Chris. Uh, th th thanks very much. Um, thanks, th thanks, Graham, for the invitation. Thanks, everyone, everyone for, for being here. I hope we can share a little bit about it as well. Um, I've got a better picture than Alistair, um, glossy of the hospital, the one day of sunshine um, in our, our five-year-old hospital was bathed in in Glasgow. Um, and uh, some key points to call out, we have an almost all single room hospital. Um, Glasgow and Scotland got hit a little bit later and a little bit less hard than some of the rest of the UK did. That meant we could lean on and learn from the experience in China, the experience from Italy, the experience, early experience from London, and it gives us a little bit of time to get things reorientated um, within the hospital area where we don't have single rooms, our immediate assessment unit and our critical care floor. Um, so we took a little bit of time to get things reorganized around there and came a little bit later to respiratory support. So I'm, I'm speaking from that sort of position and you can draw your own conclusions to how relevant or otherwise that is to, to local practice. All things pass. Um, we planned to be able from the modeling to deal with a, a fourfold increase in our ICU requirements and in our non-invasive respiratory support requirements. So that would be 700 ICU beds and 700 HDU beds. We didn't end up needing those or anything like those. We got hit harder in Glasgow than some other areas of Scotland did those. So we were a fair bit on the peak. The bottom right there, that's my monthly resting heart rate um, that I pulled out my Apple Watch from the last 12 months. So like I say, all things pass. I also don't have a clinical management role. Um, I'm an innovator and, and get to be a bit of a rogue performer. Um, so perhaps my fatigue is passing quicker than, 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 um, than Alistair's is. We are about where you were. So around, I think at the top, we had 38 patients in our ICU and a similar number on, with severe respiratory failure or, or non-invasive respiratory support. So matching where I think you're at or, or are approaching in the CAPE at the moment. One of the things that we put in place early on was, was that senior decision making and perhaps for discharge, but if coming in to establish a treatment escalation plan and a care bundle, and that care bundle evolved a little bit and I deliberately haven't shown the text. I don't want you to read it. I'm going to share this, share this and links to it at the end. So 
based on pandemic triage criteria would be for escalation to critical care, more information is required over the first 24 hour period and AMBER criteria for ward level care and we set relatively conservative oxygen targets for those patients to minimise risk of hypercapnia with a lot of obesity and a lot of comorbidity but also we had concerns about oxygen supply. We set up a daily escalation MDT with critical care referral physician, respiratory medicine, two of us at least, infectious diseases, renal, palliative care and agile input as required from others. We were discussing at the top of that surge 10 patients a day, but as well as discussing individual patients and making decisions on them to minimize that individual fatigue and individual referral volume, we were discussing situational awareness, case spread across the hospital, number of patients at risk for needing escalation, um, and learning from each other's experience and what was coming out from the literature and the London experience and so forth as we went. And we adapted our approach. One key message and one key challenge um, is that a lot of these patients, even in, in the Scottish winter, were coming to us pretty dry, pretty hot, um, had been self-isolating for a period at home, and then trying to re-establish and maintain hydration and nutrition. Um, we missed a little bit of a trick there early on and a lot more patients required renal support and critical care early. We went to a liberal fluid strategy. When you have patients who are tachypneic, requiring non-invasive respiratory support, prone position, and getting them fed, nutrition supported, they have sticky blood, thinking about peripheral lines and parenteral nutrition, these were a big challenge and I don't think we really cracked it, but we, we thought hard about it and, and really took a very encouraging and proactive approach and I think that has helped with some of the later complications as we went on. Thrombosis, that COVID is a sticky disease, um, is well described and I'm sure you're experiencing plenty of that at the moment. We've got our guidelines as to what our thromboprophylaxis was. We didn't go as intensive on that as some centres, and we had a strategy of thrombovigilance. If someone looked like they might have a pulmonary embolism, they go in the scanner when they're well enough or they're anticoagulated pending definitive information um, when they're not well enough to go in the scanner. And we had a lot of radiology support with that. Um, and that was part of, if you like, our, our overall strategy. Some other units approached it, approached it differently. Once we had our situation organized and our, our staffing model and our PPE and PPE confidence sorted out, we were appreciating from the first 20 or so patients into the ICU that we didn't seem to be doing these patients any favors by intubating them too early. And also we had the situation regarding concern about transmission of infection sorted out as well. You can see that this scan is not good. What is the key message about this is that this patient was managed end to end non-invasively. So she did not require intubation or ventilation throughout her stay. Things look bad um, from the front, but it, you can maybe appreciate just on this coronal section, which is taken from, toward, towards the back of her lungs, that things aren't quite as bad there. COVID's a sticky disease, and that one of the aspects of the pathophysiology is, is a lot of atelectasis. Um, there's an adverse effect of anatomy and gravity. If you imagine the lobe of a lung as being like a cone with alveolar balloons within it. If you put that within a cylindrical structure and then apply gravity, and of course, a lot of our patients are obese, a lot of our patients have diabetes, that's the typical phenotype of the patient with aggravated COVID, um, then these effects are, are, are amplified. We can overcome some of that by flipping our patient onto their tummy um, and taking away some of the gravity, or we can provide some external positive airway pressure and overcome some of that expiratory flow limitation um, and intrinsic peak. So from very early on, we were appreciating the benefits of prone positioning on symptoms, on oxygen requirements, and on our impression on the trajectory of our patients. Um, so we put that in place with our physiotherapists supporting some patients, but really any patient at the front door who was symptomatic or had an oxygen requirement was being asked to self-prone from very early on in our management of the pandemic. We managed a higher proportion of our patients with proning than our neighboring hospital. They managed a higher proportion of their patients with CPAP um, with it as well. Our first take on outcomes is very similar. Because we came to this a little bit later and had the early Italian and London experience, we had a little bit of time to really evaluate what CPAP was required and how we were going to work in this. Look at the different configurations, look at the different setups and what we can achieve with it. The bottom line is that any old kit will work fine. Kit that you use for home CPAP, kit that you would use as a, as a near ICU type semi-blended ventilator, all achieve the same thing. 
whether we used uh, wall CPAP Bussignac valve um, or the UCL modification of that, we achieved really the same outcomes. And it's about the confidence of the team, the confidence of the patient, and the face mask um, and mask fitting if you are going to go with CPAP strategy. We built up a lot of resources um, and have a whole lot of videos um, available that would allow this to potentially be scaled up and some of our surgical nurse practitioners, theatre recovery nurseries, theatre nurses to be able to do and provide CPAP if that was what we we're going to have to do to the number of patients that we had available. So we've got links to all of those videos and we simplified the setup um, that was needed so that it was minimising uh, the risk of further spread from the patient if this was an aerosol generating procedure. There's controversy as to whether it is or not, um, and I would stay away from that one. We've been pretty fortunate in the UK with the recovery trial, and, and really it's a, it's, it's a model for agile trial delivery from now on. More than 10,000 patients in the UK in the recovery trial as of a month ago, and obviously positive results press released yesterday from the steroid arm, and that's likely to change our, our severe respiratory failure COVID bundle very quickly once we see the full data from that and can pick it apart. Recovery respiratory support is now open. Um, it's got 60 centres and as of yesterday, only 120 patients enrolled. But that's three arms, normal care, CPAP or nasal high flow therapy. And from the pre-chat that we had um, with Graham, I understand that similar numbers, but instead of a strategy of proning and CPAP for non-invasive respiratory support, you're using nasal high flow therapy. And I think the jury is out as to which of those might be more efficacious. My own take is that, is that a little bit of everything might work better and it's about individual treatment trials. So we would put a patient prone. If they improved, carry on. If they were comfortable, carry on. If with their central obesity or their reflux, they weren't managing so well with that, get them back on their, on their back and try the CPAP earlier um, rather than later. The threshold for thinking about this, the 35 to 40% oxygen requirement point, that's when I think you need want to get in the mix. Some patients loved CPAP, some patients hated it, and so on and so forth. The setup of our hospital meant that our ICU is right next to her high dependency. So we were able to review these patients multiple times a day. So a strategy of deferred intubation could rapidly be converted to intubate and, and bail out when it wasn't working. And of course, different institutions, you may not have that, 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 that flexibility. So I think that's the last aspect to really kind of bring into the care. We've pulled together the first bits of evaluation of our outcomes. So a third of the patients within the respiratory wards were above that oxygen threshold and managed just with proning. Um, and their outcomes were less than 3% in hospital mortality. In our high dependency unit, where we were using proning and non-invasive respiratory support, 19% overall mortality, including the patients who progressed to ICU. So we're putting ourselves at the, I feel like the left-hand side, we're, we're looking better than some reports or otherwise with that as well. That's not definitive, that's really just a safety signal. So I think that our strategy of treatment escalation plan, escalation MDT, care bundle, and deferred intubation with non-invasive respiratory support, leaning either on proning at one site, CPAP more than proning at another site, is looking at least safe, and time will tell, and hopefully randomized trials will give us better, better ideas as to what modality of support for what phenotype or stage of presentation is relevant. I'll leave that sitting there if anyone takes to take a shot, but th these are Dropbox links to all of our respiratory failure resources, um, our SOP for CPAP, our patient information sheet for self pronin And Philips hosted three webinars from teams across Europe and across London, um, across the early phase and then across later with experience with non-invasive respiratory support. And that's where we got a lot of the, the ideas, a lot of the feedback um, and a lot of the discussion that's led us to, to the approach that we take took in Glasgow came from. And if you want to take a deeper dive into these, um, I think that's the place to go. I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. It was really uh, important to hear about your experience of respiratory support. And I, I'm sure there's gonna be a, a number of questions. Um, you know, we're not using CPAP in South Africa um, and people will want to know, you know, more details about that in the question time. So uh, then we're gonna move on to our next uh, speaker who is Dave Moore. Uh, who will be well known to TB researchers. Uh, Dave leads a TB research group in Lima, Peru. He's also the course director for the Diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene at the London School of, of Tropical Medicine and, and Hygiene. Uh, 
uh, is a cons uh, consultant in infectious diseases and tropical medicine at University College London Hospital. Uh, has worked in South Africa in Klabisa Hospital and KZN in the mid-1990s. And uh, during the COVID-19 surge in London, he developed hospital triage and cohorting strategies uh, and is uh, currently investigating post-COVID recovery and, and complications. Um, so really now a perspective from London. We've heard three perspectives from Glasgow uh, and now a perspective from London from Dave. So over to you, Dave. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Graham. Thanks very much for the invitation to, to join this, this team. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear um, other people talk about their experiences and, and reflect on what resonates with us. And uh, much of what um, all, all three of the speakers have said, uh, I would echo. Um, we certainly took an early hit in London. Um, and uh, I, like Alistair, I remember uh, an enormous amount of time and effort being put into uh, screening people, waiting for a first case, and the excessive uh, energy that was put into uh, some of the PPE and infection control measures and hospitalizing patients waiting two or three days up to a week for a swab result. Um, it seems extraordinary that that was only five months ago. So um, I was mindful that the other three were going to touch on lots of the things that I could have talked about, which I'm glad I, have, I don't now need to. So I'm going to touch on these three things, really. Um, triage at the front door. We do not have the benefit of a hospital with um, 1,677 single rooms. That's quite extraordinary. So uh, I'll talk a bit about cohorting, which I realise some of which may be relevant to some parts of South Africa and other bits which will be irrelevant. Um, unfortunately. I'll mention in passing the UCL Ventura CPAP, um, which Chris just mentioned, just so that you're aware of it, um, and a bit about the post-COVID war. I, I should say that all of this is work that's done largely by colleagues um, rather than necessarily led by myself, but uh, we're quite a large team at UCH. And one of the great advantages we've had uh, is that we had an awful lot of people who were doing uh, research who we, we drew back into clinical work uh, during the outbreak. So let's see if we can move this along. We can't. Try again. I'm having trouble moving forward. We're seeing the um, slide, uh, we've just moved one forward there. We, we saw the slide of uh, the crowds at Buckingham Palace. Uh, you're seeing it before me, great. Okay, so let me, if I can go back to that one, I was, that was really just to highlight quite how extraordinary um, the lockdown was in, uh, I'm gonna go back, sorry about that. Uh, quite extraordinary the lockdown was in the UK. Uh, I, for one, did not believe that we would manage to achieve that sort of behaviour change uh, across the country. Oh, I'm going right back to the beginning. Here we go. Um, but undoubtedly, the lockdown, uh, which on reflection, uh, we didn't do nearly as early as many other countries, and, and we paid the price for that, um, had an extraordinary effect. And I guess when you don't have people mixing in this way, that's not a great surprise. It took a number of weeks for it to happen but we suddenly saw the number of admissions to the hospital fall off a cliff. And as I was saying to Graham before we started, uh, we now have so few cases coming through the door of uh, University College Hospital in London that the various trials who are trying to recruit um, patients for treatment um, evaluations are squabbling about the single figure numbers of people coming through the door. So at least for now, uh, in London, we have very few uh, new cases coming through the door. And we're slightly holding our breath to see when the second wave comes because most of us believe it, it will come. However, we will be better prepared this time. The other thing that's extraordinary, if you could advance my slides for me, that's probably gonna work better because I don't seem to have a good enough connection to do that. Um, so the other thing that is extraordinary is how quickly everybody becomes an expert in this disease. Uh, and I would say that none of us really are, are experts, but our radiologists, very quickly uh, in an era when half the patients walking through the door had COVID would say this is a classical COVID chest x-ray or a classical COVID CT, uh, which of course when the pretest probability is extremely high is, is safe ground to be on. And of course we all got fairly um, uh, secure in our, in, our in our clinical diagnoses. I should say the other thing that changed uh, 
um, far too slowly for us was access to rap rapid testing. So we now have um, one of the Cepheid expert machines sitting in A&E and we have access to 40 rapid um, PCR tests a day, which is not that many, but it's enough at the current uh, rate of admissions, um, which gives a turnaround time in, in an hour or so of, of uh, whether or not a patient is PCR positive on a swab. But at the time that we were uh, underwater, it was taking a good couple of days. And then this patient uh, came in uh, during my uh, on-call last week, uh, and this patient uh, looks a bit like a duck, but is actually not a duck. This is a patient with pneumocystis pneumonia and uncontrolled HIV. And of course, the request for the chest x-ray didn't mention the, uh, the HIV infection. So this was also reported as this looks highly suspicious for COVID. So uh, it was really just, this point was really just to highlight that, um, as, as other speakers have already, that there is an awful lot of other infectious disease around that we need to remember not to forget. Uh, and undoubtedly, and I'm sure this will be the case in South Africa, um, patients with other diseases that are not COVID will run into problems from not being able to access healthcare and for avoiding um, healthcare settings because they're understandably frightened. So during the surge in London, we had a we had an issue. We don't have uh, many uh, isolation rooms. In fact, uh, the infectious diseases ward shares with the haematology ward in a uncomfortable marriage, uh, a ward that has most of the isolation rooms in the hospital. Uh, and uh, so we needed to work out a way in which we could prioritize who should be put into isolation and who could be put into cohorted areas, which were either deemed uh, to be likely to have uh, infection or unlikely to have infection. And what the team came up with was a triage system based on really categorizing people into one of four groups uh, based on two criteria. What is the likelihood, how strongly do we believe this patient has infection? And so if they were thought to be at high risk of infection, they were either a B or a C. And if they do have infection, how likely are they to do badly? So if your probability of a, high, of a poor outcome was high, in other words, if you had a comorbidity um, or were um, over 70, 80, 90 years of age, then you fell into the sort of high probability of a poor outcome group. I should just mention something that's, that's pertinent and hasn't been mentioned yet, which is um, something that's been quite prominent in our news here, which is the um, increased mortality amongst um, people from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. And there's been quite a lot of discussion about whether the biological or, or sociological um, uh, causes of this. Um, and recent, this week, I think, um, publication from Public Health England has indicated that the risk of death amongst black people who become infected is four times higher than that of white people and that of non-Chinese Asian populations is two and a half fold that of white um, Caucasian people who become infected. Now the reasons for that are not well understood, um, but the data is now reasonably secure and accounts for most confounding. So that's just something that is, is clearly of, of relevance um, when considering outcomes according to racial groups. This is what happened to those uh, people. So uh, I have to say that um, probability of poor outcome at the time we were instituting this did not include racial groups. It include, included comorbidities, it included uh, obesity, and it included age and, and, and frailty scores as alluded to before. Although it turns out the frailty score wasn't as, as useful as we had believed before. But essentially those who are at high risk of a poor outcome um, we would put, and, and low probability of infection, we would put it into a side room for isolation to protect them, not to, uh, to, to re try and reduce the risk of them becoming infected. And those who uh, were at high probability of infection and high probability of poor outcome will be the second priority for a side room, or they will be cohorted with other people in a, uh, in a well distanced uh, bay. And then we would have people who were, we thought were highly likely to have a positive COVID result uh, in one bay and those who we tested but were thought were relatively low likelihood to have COVID in another space. And I, I, the data uh, are reported and how, how that played out are reported in, uh, in a publication that's now at least in preprint uh, and you can have a look at those. But essentially, it's very hard, as one of the speakers said earlier, to predict who does and who doesn't have um, COVID. What we managed to do was we managed to protect 
those who didn't fairly well, but at least half of those turned out to have COVID. So we didn't suspect COVID. We had a, we had a, um, a low suspicion that they had infection, um, but we wanted to shield them, but about half of them turned out to have infection in this setting when we had a large numbers coming through the door. Uh, and I won't dwell on that um, any further, other than to show a rather complex um, flow chart, which um, I'm not gonna run through, but which is in the publication. Sorry, my connectivity is, is letting me down slightly. Um, and so this is essentially how, how that flow worked. These are all people who aren't going to ICU. Our intensive care unit was essentially, um, uh, we have 20 side rooms, I'm gonna go back, we had 20 side rooms on the intensive care unit where patients could be shielded, but everybody else was in cohorts. And I should just play testament really to, to our intensive care unit, which uh, normally runs uh, at around about 40 beds, uh, 35 beds, and doubled capacity uh, and took referrals from across London, uh, ventilating patients in recovery rooms, in theatres, um, bringing in people who are used to just putting people to sleep and doing anaesthetics um, and training them up as intensivists. So they did an extraordinary job. But essentially this triage took patients into one or four different spaces and then depending on what their results uh, came up with, they were given a, a sort of definitive discharge, which may or may not have involved them moving. It's at this point, it's worth mentioning that um, swabbing patients, as any laboratory microbiologist will say, uh, there, are, there are two components to how good your test is. And if your swab is poor, your result will be poor. Rubbish in, rubbish out is the, is the microbiology sort of um, uh, word. And uh, we had a negative predictive value of about 92%. That is to say, people who had a first swab, which was negative, and this is again in a time when we had about 45% of our patients that we were swabbing who were positive, 92% uh, of those negatives turned out to be people who did not end up having COVID. And the other 8% were people who either on a subsequent swab or on the basis of that classic CT scan were determined to have COVID. So you have to take a view if you're going to de-isolate someone on the basis of a negative swab, that it's not, a, it's not an open and shut case. Uh, and sometimes you have to keep it, we kept people in isolation despite having negative swabs. I'm stuck again. Uh, you've had a little bit about CPAP, so I'm not going to talk much about that other than to mention that University College Hospital is adjacent to UCL. And on the left-hand side is uh, Becky, who's one of the professors of engineering at uh, UCL, who worked with uh, Mercedes-AMG, who are the engineering um, part of Mercedes, who make Lewis Hamilton's Formula One cars. And they essentially took and um, uh, reverse engineered an existing CPAP machine that's been around for many years uh, to create something that was relatively uh, simple to manufacture. And, uh, uh, and, and relatively simple to use. And the link is there as to, as to how you can access these, uh, these pieces of uh, kit. Uh, and the important thing about this for us was, firstly, it, it gave uh, the opportunity to expand CPAP quite a lot, not just within our hospital, but across the UK and now internationally. So Becky is now working in dozens of countries. And importantly, they've put the engineering blueprints up on the internet and they've been downloaded in, um, tens of countries now by hundreds of different firms for people to build these CPAP machines at relatively low cost and then use them. And I just would echo what Chris said that, that this is an oxygen hungry disease and CPAP is an oxygen hung hungry process. Um, I don't really think, and I don't think Becky or any of uh, our ITU team really believe that these devices can be worked off um, anything other than piped wall oxygen. Um, so I, I, this really doesn't work with cylinders. But certainly um, CPAP, our work at UCLH was a bit of an outlier in London. There weren't many centres who wanted to do CPAP. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that, but perhaps the most important reason is the infection control concerns. This is our pathway. I'm not going to go into it, into it in a lot of detail, but it's essentially why we, how we decided who would end up on CPAP. Everywhere that CPAP was done, it was done in an area where everybody had to wear full PPE. So this is an aerosol generating procedure. Um, and 
it is estimated and the data is yet to emerge, but we believe that about 50% of people who would have ended up ventilated uh, got onto CPAP and got off CPAP and escaped ventilation. And our uh, mortality rate for people who went on to ventilation was 50%. Uh, also, there was extremely high rates of reintubation. So extubating these patients is, is, uh, is very tricky. Okay, just moving quickly on. Yeah, if that were possible. This is another patient who I had on my take last week. Um, this is a young man from Pakistan who had uh, about five weeks ago had a respiratory illness whilst in lockdown and didn't have a test at home, didn't have contact with anybody else. After that point, uh, got better. And then two days before admission described pleuritic chest pain and breathlessness and came in with a fairly unremarkable chest x-ray um, and has uh, significant filling defects in both lower lobes and has got fairly extensive pulmonary embolic disease. His PCR by this stage is negative. Um, he's only got pulmonary embolic, he's got nothing else. Uh, and his serology is positive. So we're pretty certain there's no other underlying reason why this guy should have a thromboembolic disease. He's otherwise normally fit and well and ambulant. So uh, this we're seeing, and you, you will know about this, but we're seeing an awful lot of this. Um, and uh, so late after infection, which has apparently been fairly trivial, uh, is becoming something that we're seeing a little bit more of and being a bit concerned about. There was quite a vogue at one stage for giving people thromboprophylaxis. Um, I have to say I wasn't enthusiastic for it myself, but thromboprophylaxis. There was a trial set up, but unfortunately, well, actually fortunately, the, um, the way it passed before the trial could really get up and run in and recruit. So I think we still lack randomized control trial evidence of who should be anticoagulated, um, particularly amongst those who are discharged home or in primary care. Uh, maybe this is something that you could, you could be addressing in South Africa, maybe it's already happening. Um, but this is certainly a concern. And I'm really just gonna finish talking about what happens after this disease. We've got a lot of people who've recovered from um, fairly dramatic uh, life-changing illness. Um, many of them have got renal impairment, which hasn't improved. Uh, we've got people who've developed quite significant lung fibrosis. Uh, a number of patients with persistent fever, which doesn't seem to have any other underlying explanation, which is quite difficult to understand. Again, on our last take, we had a 22-year-old medical student who has this hyperinflammatory syndrome, which looked very much like the um, syndrome described in children, this um, sort of hyperinflammatory syndrome, which looks a bit like Kawasaki's disease. She doesn't have Kawasaki's disease. She actually has an HLH-like syndrome with a high ferritin, with a high CRP, with a very, very high fever. Um, and she's a medical student who was exposed back in March uh, in Leeds and has returned to her family home, which is in the south of England. Uh, she had a period in hospital uh, in one of our local hospitals where she was given some immunosuppression and her symptoms went away and they flared again. So she's got an extra, we're concerned actually, there's something else underlying it, but at the heart of it, it looks like she has this hyperinflammatory syndrome, which was at least provoked in the first instance by this virus. So there's some odd stuff going on. Um, we're doing much of our consultations in the hospital virtually now, and that's really transformed, uh, I think, how we're going to work in the future. Um, Eric has already mentioned ambulatory oximetry, so I won't touch on that, but we did quite a bit of work on working out who should be going home with oximeters. And indeed, we had our homeless population in London, largely housed in hotels, and, and they were monitored with oximetry as well. That had mixed results, I would have to say. Um, and then just finally on this point, we are in primary care, our primary care colleagues uh, rapidly set up what they called hot hubs and cold hubs. Hot hubs being, as Erica said, not places where these people would be tested, but places where people with fever would go so that they would be kept away from people who didn't have fever. Um, unfortunately, again, by the time this thing had really got into action, uh, our uh, epidemic was starting to subside, at least in London. And then just finally, um, because of all this stuff that's been going on uh, in the sort of aftermath of infection, we are now in the process, and I'm not involved in this, but many of my colleagues are, in setting up a large uh, treatment and research cohort of people who are uh, post-COVID. And the range of conditions that uh, are being followed up include the psychological, sorry if this is a bit bumpy, the psychological um, uh, consequences of being in hospital for two or three months and, and uh, 
not been able to see your family during all of that time other than uh, via a smartphone. Um, the renal um, consequences, the respiratory consequences, which I mentioned, uh, the thromboembolic uh, complications. I have another chap on the ward at the moment who developed a compartment syndrome in the aftermath of uh, coagulopathy that affected his right leg and has had an amputation. So there's lots of downstream stuff that is um, clearly troubling for many of these patients going forward. My slides seem to be stuck. I will stop there, Graham. There we go. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Dave. That was excellent. And, and just highlighting those three areas that are, are very relevant to our practice. Um, so I've, we, we, we have a bit of time for, for discussion. I'm, I'm just going to ask one question um, that perhaps to uh, Dave and Alistair, and just if you can give it just a, a short answer, then that'll allow us time to move on to, to questions from the chat room. But Dave, you mentioned uh, the case of, of that patient who had clearly had COVID symptoms as an outpatient and then presented with pulmonary emboli. I'm just interested to specifically ask the question of, of patients in London and Glasgow who've been sick in hospital uh, with respiratory failure with COVID and are discharged. Um, have you had patients returning with pulmonary emboli post-discharge? Because it relates to one of the questions that I've been asked several times uh, in, in the last week of whether we should be considering uh, thromboprophylaxis when patients go home. Um, and currently we don't do that. And I think the question is whether there is experience of patients returning with pulmonary emboli. Yeah, we've had several. Yeah, okay. and so, so we have this thing called the CRADE follow-up, which is a COVID uh, rapid access infectious diseases follow-up. And we basically telephone all of our patients who've been discharged uh, week one, week two, and then if they're not sustainable in a, oh, my video stopped. It's clearly not sustainable in an era when uh, we're overwhelmed, but we can manage it now. And we've had a number who've come back. They've had a D-dimer and uh, a, a CTPA and have been found to have PE. So yes, it's not common, but it's certainly something we've been picking up. Yeah. Alistair, your, your experience? Yeah, similar in Glasgow. We've had patients readmitted and I, I know there's been a lot of Coagulation post this year. Chris, in a kind of better position to to give a wee bit more about that, Chris. Yes, is the short answer. We've had patients post discharge represent. Um, I we had one of our very early patients who did well after ICU, deteriorated in high dependency and died despite attempts at, at um, thrombolysis and really really burned us on that. But I shared Dave's um, uncertainty about whether we're really going to modify the outcomes of this um, with an enhanced anti anticoagulation. Our approach had been to double the dose of our usual thromboprophylaxis for patients with severe respiratory failure in hospital, but we'd only given post-discharge um, anticoagulation to those who'd had high suspicion or confirmed pulmonary embolism in hospital, and only time's going to, going to t t t tell us with that one. We could get burned in lots of other directions. At the moment, one of the commonest issues we're having in the hospital is a lot of GI bleeding. Um, these patients have re re redeclared and represented. So um, not, not COVID, but just, just in general. Um, so I, I don't know where, you, between the devil and the deep blue sea, I think. Thanks, thanks for those answers. Mark? Yeah, sorry, Graham, if I might, if I might jump in. Graham, sorry, we, our ICU also doubled their anticoagulation uh, after some early traumatic mm. experiences, and we have had a number of intracerebral bleeds as well. So I think you're quite right. It's, a, it's difficult, but it needs a study. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark, are there questions from the chat room that, that you want to bring in? It's great. Wendy has them. So one of the questions are, are there any thoughts why black African descent and Asian individuals have a higher probability of poor outcomes? Anybody from the speakers, any thoughts why they're at greater risk of poor outcomes? Go on, Alistair, you take it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's lots of thoughts and uh, I, I think the honest answer is we don't know. Um, I think in the UK context, there's been discussion around um, socioeconomic factors and whether that it's tied up with that. I think some of the data would suggest that it's more than that. Um, we know with some other illnesses that certainly there are kind of racial differences in terms 
of um, certainly respiratory illness and an extent of, of lower respiratory infection with different viruses, thinking about flu, for example. Um, but I'm not sure we, we really know much more than that. David, any thoughts? No, I mean, I, I, I agree. I, I, one of the things that people have been thinking for a long time, in London at least, is that this is about social mixing patterns and uh, exposure. So the, 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 the prevalence of infection or the incidence of infection in that population may not be much higher than the incidence of infection in the, in the white population, but the progression of the disease is the same in both groups. Uh, sorry, that's the other way around. So the incidence of infection may be higher and therefore the risk of progression of severe disease may not be any different. It may just be that there's more infection in, that, in those groups. That doesn't seem to be being borne out entirely by the seroprevalence data, but I think it's a bit early to to be sure about that. Um, and then you've got to factor in all the, the prevalence of comorbidities in the different populations and particularly the prevalence of um, uh, obesity. So I, I don't think we really know. And then there's a comment from Gary Martins in terms of the positive CPAP experience from two centers where we hear in our own institution should be rethinking our strategy. Maybe, maybe Graham, you want to comment on the our approach to CPAP? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think, um, as I explained to colleagues before the, the webinar started, you know, in Cape Town, really our approach has been high flow nasal oxygen uh, to, as, as a strategy uh, to attempt to avoid mechanical ventilation in those patients deteriorating despite a non rebreather mask. Um, and we've had good outcomes, you know, to date with 40% of patients. Uh, avoiding ventilation with that strategy. There have been concerns about CPAP just because we uh, don't have uh, the infection control context um, to, uh, to deliver CPAP um, in negative pressure rooms. And I'm, I'm just interested whether, you know, from Chris um, and from Dave, you know, what was it? You, you've explained to us that you were using uh, PPE with, you know, uh, aerosolization uh, it kind of uh, appropriate uh, PPE, but in terms of negative pressure rooms or single rooms, uh, what what uh, particular infection control was put in place, and you know, in in sense of whether that could be transferred to our city. Sure, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with that one. So we we didn't really get going with with CPAP until we had that 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 one pinned down. We were using all staff in full enhanced respiratory PPE with uh, N95 or, or F FFP3 mask in the clinical area where CPAP was being regularly conducted. And we had single rooms, but not negative pressure rooms. Um, we'd had a couple of patients in negative pressure rooms earlier on who we were trying to defer or, or avoid intubation um, for a variety of reasons. So, but that was really just at, at the start, you'd quickly exceed your capacity. If that's similar to the environment where you're providing nasal high flow therapy, I'm not sure that you would achieve better intubation avoidance um, a, around that sort of 40, 40 to 50 percent mark that that feels similar to what, what we've achieved here and I think what Dave will say. Dave anything that you wanted to add? Yeah I mean all, all of the CPAP in our hospital was on it was in one or two places it was either on the intensive care unit where everybody was in full PPE all the time including N95 masks and so the CPAP bay uh, was was entirely um, uh, full PPE. The, and then we converted one ward, which is largely a, a ward with bays, and again that was entirely um, PPE. So it, it wasn't uh, people were in, uh, and the bays were, were you know it was a ward that was entirely isolated from the rest of the hospital. And I would I would echo um, I, I think it might have been Alistair's comment about um, staff common areas. Um, we were extraordinarily careful in the patient facing areas, but often we'd sit in the staff room and think there are too many of us in here. And it would took rather a long time before uh, there was universal adoption of everybody in the hospital, everywhere in the hospital, wearing at least a surgical mask, um, which, you know, I think we should have been doing much, much earlier. Mm. I think you normalize those things and it makes life a lot easier. Mm. Um, can I just ask on the CPAP um, whether if we've got, if, if we were to consider in our setting and we have a limited uh, number of CPAP machines, are there any, is there any profile of patient that you think 
it would be more suited to, uh, to if it were, was to be rationed. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> there may be a value call um, to be made there. Would this be? Would you use it for your patients who had more severe respiratory failure, where you would not want to intubate them at all? Um, that would be one one choice. Whereas this would be their ceiling of care, or is it a a phenotype of patient where you're trying to avoid deferred intubation, but you would intubate, but they're at highest risk to, to do badly. Um, so that would be your obese patient who already perhaps has a, a, a sleep apnea that's, that's not been fully diagnosed. Um, and there was, a, there was a phase through it where there was a patient from my clinics coming in uh, to the high dependency ward, um, you know, three, four times, three, four times a day uh, with it as well. I, I, my feeling is that we got the most out of CPAP in that patient cohort, the patient with big tummy who was struggling to self-prone, um, who was already fairly atelectatic and, 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 and a bit, bit sludged up, but not so bad, so tachypneic, so distressed, or with other complications that, that progress into to level three intensive care support was inevitable. Hmm. My colleagues at Glasgow Royal deployed CPAP earlier and in, uh, provided that care to a larger proportion of patients who would not have been for intubation and they reckon their early mortality is looking about the 25, 30% mark. Um, so it, the, the feeling is that it has perhaps helped some patients where it wouldn't otherwise, who, who wouldn't otherwise have got through. But I, I don't think we can say definitively yet. Again, we need uh, more experience, uh, more time to think through what we've, what, what our, our data and, and work it through and, and ideally so some trial evidence as well. Yeah, we had, I think, at times we had sorry, Alistair. At times we had thirty-five to forty patients uh, on CPAP. The most important thing was making sure it was the right patient. Some some people just don't get on with it, and you have to stop fairly early. Uh, and I think the second most important thing was having a treatment escalation plan in place that you knew where you were going if CPAP didn't work, um, because you can't embark upon that without knowing what your exit strategy is. And lots of people failed CPAP and that was, and then they moved back to the ward for palliation. And then surprised us by keeping going and walking out of hospital a few weeks later. But many people did. Sorry. I was just gonna say in the kind of context CPAP, and you know, the effectiveness of early proning of patients on, you know, just on our wards um, and the effect that that could have on oxygenation and the kind of uh, effect that that had after they had stopped proning. I think it, it was quite a revelation as a non-respiratory doctor to, to kind of uh, appreciate the effectiveness of that and, and using that early. Wendy, any, any, uh, any last questions? From so there's one, one last question. The risk of thromboembolism in individuals with mild symptoms as opposed to severe disease, is there still a risk? <laughs> any, any takers? Yes, there is. I think the answer is yes. And, and I th as we've already discussed, I think I think this is an area we're really not sure about, but we have to be aware that there are there are risks in in anticoagulation as well, and it's I think it's a it's a tough tough call. I think that's yeah, all right. I think it's fair to say there wasn't. Sorry, I was just going to say I think it was fair to say there wasn't unanimity of um, managing patients from the emergency department with a presumptive diagnosis, without even a proven diagnosis, um, with anticoagulation, which I was pretty uncomfortable about, but maybe that was the right call, I've no idea. Okay, so um, just uh, to end off with, to say a big thank you to um, Alistair, Chris, Dave, and uh, Erica, who had to go back to the clinic. I think it's been a fantastic webinar, really useful insights from the UK. Um, and thank you for your time and, and the efforts in, in preparing and, and uh, sharing your experiences today. So back to Mark and Wendy and, and thanks to the panel. Thank you, Grant. Thank you to everybody. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.